Good morning, everybody. And today we're going to be talking about gender identity and the philosophy and psychology behind this um, concept. And since uh, we are talking about gender identity, we've decided to put on our sunglasses and look like a uh, right liberals right now. I don't exactly know whether this is what they look like, but indeed we are going to be talking about this phenomenon from a philosophical and psychological perspective with our dear Warren Jew. Warren Jew, how are you? I'm great, thank you. So uh, what's your new insight on gender identity? Yes, because I think that when we're talking about gender identity, there has to be um, two levels of criticism and two approaches to gender identity. Because I think that you either talk about gender identity as an objective or something which does exist and is true, or you talk about gender identity as something which is completely made up. And at that point, it is completely meaningless when you actually use gender identity pronouns. For example, if you go on the internet, when someone says, I am Zizer, or I am they, them, or I am he, him, you either are talking about he, him, and these pronouns as something which objectively describes something about your personality, or it is something which completely is meaningless and unknowable apart from um, your own understanding of the word. And in that sense, I would say, well, that is fine as well. So, however, it just leads to a completely different structure when it comes to the understanding of gender pronouns and gender identity. And I think that by exploring, and in this video, we're planning to explore these two um, schemas would allow us to have a further understanding of, well, how, what should be the proper framework and what should be the proper approach to our gender identity. Mm -hmm. so what do you say that the current uh, discourse, mainstream discourse on gender identity, uh, rests on a certain category confusion between the two? As in, mm -hmm. sometimes they treat gender identity as the first kind of saying it has a real existence, and sometimes they treat it as a second kind of saying that there's there's nothing to it. It's just your personal choice, completely subjective. And it is in this confusion between the two that makes discussions about gender identity so fraught with, I guess, a con controversy and difficulty. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with that uh, categorization because I do believe that most of the time when the left and the right are having this kind of conflict, they're not necessarily arguing against each other, but more so they're talking past each other in the sense that I think when the right and more conservative types are criticizing this new form of, this new form of gender identity and spectrum, what they're criticizing is the idea that there is no way to objectively prove um, these ideas and these concepts. However, at the same time, when the response comes from the left, it is more so the idea that, well, yeah, so what if we can't prove them? That is based on the subjective understanding. But at the same time, when they are calling the right to use these gender pronouns, the, the desire or the need that someone else uses the pronouns for oneself, that kind of the, the need for the other to verify one's own gender pronoun leads to the necessity for it to be some form of objective reality. Otherwise, it would collapse entirely. And as a result, I think that while the left use it as if it is subjective, they demand it to be objective. That's really interesting. So because I, I, I just went through the horror title, IX, uh, sexual, what's it called? Uh, gender inclusivity and like uh, sexual sort of, I don't know, uh, like those, those kind of uh, course. And there was something that sort of bothered me, I think. There's, because there's like two sides, right? One side is um, you have, one side is saying that sex doesn't really matter. And then the other side saying, well, sex matters so much that any form of contact between human beings of opposite sex, or, or at least between human beings who are attracted to each other, or one attracted to another, has has to be written with consent. So I, I can't really reconcile myself with the two, just as in this case, I can't really reckon, you, you can't really reconcile the subjective and the objective uh, definitions or ways of looking at gender identity with them mixing together into the same ideology. And it makes it difficult to swallow. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. I definitely think that that is something which is very dangerous, especially for the youth of today, because they're being told two different narratives. First of all, that you can pursue and almost achieve anything that you want on this sexual and gender plane. But at the same time, they're told that, well, no, this is a completely formal and legalized system. And this is not a very new um, clash. It's a very old clash, which has been, been there since, I, I would say, um, the, the clash between the Judeo-Christian um, development. It's this idea of, well, are you 
are you an individual or are you a person? What is your relationship to the law? And I think that is the Christian answer, which um, provides kind of the solution to, well, the subjective and the objective. But rather, and, and I don't think we need to go too far into this Christian kind of thing, because I think it's a side note, but it's something worth uh, noting in mind is that in the past, there was always this idea that you're either following the law all the time or you're following the, this subjective um, experience all the time. But at the same time, you have to recognize that when you're moving from one to the other, it's not either either one or the other. However, when you're using one mode of analysis, you must notice that, well, in that situation, I must not equivocate with the other mode of analysis. And you must have a very strict, and I would say a very analytical approach to both analyses and say, well, in, in this circumstances, I am using the subjective and I recognize I'm using the subjective. And in this circumstance, say, well, I'm using the more objective one. And then in this circumstance, let's talk about it as if it's objective and not conflate the two, which I think is the heart of all the disagreement. Actually, I feel like the Judeo-Christian thing is actually not a side note, but the center to the whole thing. Um, because like, at least in my understanding of Christianity, for me, Jesus is like this figure that unites the subjective and the objective. So you have the, uh, the laws uh, from Judaism, of like uh, tons of laws, very strict. Uh, you can't work in Sabbath, etc. And then you got Jesus coming in and saying things like, well, adultery is not actually just following the rules, but not even looking at someone else. Or uh, you can you can save people on the Sabbath. So like there are there are ways for rules to be broken and for the subjective and the objective to cohere. And I think that's the that's the brilliance of the Jesus project, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say we can maybe, I feel like we can maybe explore the whole subjective and objective discussion through the lens of Jesus and see whether Jesus provides a solution to the two. I think that'll be a very interesting way mm -hmm. uh, to conduct the conversation. Mm -hmm. And maybe make and it less con controversial, which might, which might be better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, perhaps let's take a sign on, and not necessarily I'm side noting the Jesus conversation, but just keep that framework in mind and put that on the side as we then turn to the gender analysis of the objective and the subjective. Because I think that um, what we mean by objective and the subjective is less so of an objective in the sense of facts, but more so objective in the sense of a trans-subjective understanding of what gender is. And that naturally moves towards a more traditional conception of gender identity of male and female precisely because that is how the other looks at you from a societal uh, status. It's a, it's a symbolic um, representation of gender. Whereas the subjective, it is not from the view of the other, but rather the view from oneself. And the question then I would say is even from the view of oneself, that definition of gender still cannot be fully developed without the other to look at it. And, and this is what I would say Berdyaev, um talks about when he says, well, in order for someone to move from an individual to a person, they have to have someone else to um, look at them and have someone else out there to have the interaction. Because without the other person looking at you, there is, an, it, there is this difficulty for you to kind of self-identify or even know who you are and have a relationship. And it's fundamentally that relationship which moves you away from an individual to a person. And then turning to Lacan, I would say, well, there's this point where he says, well, the person is not just an individual I, but rather that there is, um, there is someone else who looks at himself within one's mind. And it is precisely when one looks at the other, and that other is himself as well, when you say I am, you're talking about the you are, but that you are is yourself as well. You have these two ideas. And in order to unify it, you need a third person, which is your subconscious to figure out, well, who actually in this uh, triangle is what you are or what you desire. But I would disagree with the kind of saying that that third person not only is yourself, but also is in relationship to the other. And when you say, well, gender identity is a subjective kind of thing where I say I am, that is completely meaningless. Not that it is incorrect, but rather it is meaningless due to the lack of the third eye looking into it. And it is only when you have that third eye looking into it which allows you to have a common ground when you are talking about gender identities. Wait, wait, can you repeat that Lacanian argument again? I didn't quite follow. What Lacan is arguing is like when you say, well, what is the mode of desire? How do you desire something? Like one thing my girlfriend always observes is that I always talk about myself in the third person. I'm like, Josh Yen likes to fish. Instead of saying, I like to fish. 
And in some way, I would say a lot of times when we're thinking, we think in this third person idea, when you say, well, I like to um, go fishing, I like to study, you don't only say I like, but you're kind of viewing yourself from a third person saying I like, because without yourself knowing yourself, how on earth are you meant to know that you like to fish? And in some sense, there is this other which is saying, well, when you're saying I like to fish, you're talking about this other and saying, well, you, this Josh Yen over here likes to fish. Then the only problem when you're saying you like to fish is that you're saying, well, I like that you like to fish. Then the question is, well, where on earth is the point of the desire? Who is desiring? And what Lacan says is that, well, then there has to be the third person, the subconscious, which looks to the two and says, well, I like to fish from the subconscious. And that explores into the two. Then what my disagreement with Lacan, I say, yes, your framework is correct between the I like and the Josh Yen likes. But rather, when you're saying that I like the Josh Yen likes, how on earth are you meant to know whether that's correct or not? Because how on earth is the Josh Yen, the image that you're providing of yourself, the correct one? Because we all know how a lot of people have self-inflated ego and we all have narcissism. And in some sense, this is what Lacan also develops as well when he says, well, narcissism is the first part of psychoanalysis. Is that when you're psychoanalyzing someone, you're bringing forth the narcissism from both sides, saying, well, I like that he likes. And, and when I say he, I mean myself, but the other. And when you have that clashing together, what happens is that you're going to say, well, OK, you need the third. But that third isn't only yourself. But in order to make it objective, you need someone else. And that person from Berdyayev, the other, which is not yourself, to look upon you to you and your understanding of yourself and say, well, OK, this is your identity. This is the concepts. And are you going to be part of the concepts? Because if it's only merely subjective, when you say I am a Zizer, what happens is that that's only one side talking about the other side. And that's completely subjective with no form of verification. And it can lead to problems in that, in that subjective realm. And it leads to the lack of discussion. I would say that that is perhaps the Lacanian insight, I would say. Okay, um, I, got, I got two questions. They're sort of related to each other. One is, I didn't quite, I followed until the part where you talked about, I like that you like that uh, I like. So, so mm -hmm. how does the you get introduced? Is you an other? Because it seems like the you isn't necessarily the other, but also some part of the self. I think this, yeah. links, mm -hmm. uh, this links to my second sort of uh, misunderstanding, because it seems to me that the other doesn't necessarily have to be outside of oneself, but it can be within the self as a self-conscious other. And I think that might be answered by the first part of what I was asking. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I think perhaps this becomes very complex because I, when I'm using these you's and he's, I'm talking about how the you is meant to be the other within oneself. But then it's just when you're thinking about it, I, I like to look at it when the problem arises, when you're saying, well, I like that you like, when I'm saying you like, that is just the other within myself. So when I'm saying you, I'm referring to like Josh and likes fishing. That is the Josh and I'm referring to. So, okay. so there is those two identities and there's this kind of conflict between, well, who actually is desiring? And that's where the kind of the question about the gender identity also arises from. Okay, and you, you need an other because mm -hmm. if you want an identity within the self, then the I and the you have to sort of fuse. So mm -hmm. you can be an other to yourself, but the prerequisite for an identity is to not be an other to oneself. Would that be correct? Yes, I think that the second part is where I, I disagree with Lacan because Lacan would say, well, the, the way to merge the two is through the subconscious and that subconscious is oneself. However, I would say that it is insufficient to just have yourself merging the two together because that would keep it purely in a subjective way in that you're a total individual. In order to have a common discussion about the situation, especially that of gender, you have to have the other, which is not in yourself, a third person, or actually a fourth person looking at you saying, well, you are like, are you going to play within this symbolic realm or are you not going to be within this symbolic realm? And what on earth do you mean when you say the things? Because if you just say, well, I am Zizer, but to yourself, how on earth is anyone else going to understand that that Zizer to you might not be similar to he, him, for they? And even let's make it even more similar. How on earth would you know that the he, him for war and Jew is similar to the he, him for Josh yet, even though we both call ourselves he, him. And then the problem then lies is that, well, if we view these as a purely subjective idea, which means that he, him for Josh yet might be separate from he, him for war and Jew, 
how on earth is me calling Warren Jew he him different from me calling Warren Jew Zer, and am I misgendering them in all possible situations? And that is my fundamental criticism of this subjective view of gender identity, precisely because without this common other, otherness, perhaps this symbol, it is impossible to talk to anyone about gender without possibly misgendering them, because on a subjective plane, no one's understanding of gender can ever be the same. And as a result, they will always lead to misgendering. Okay, there's, I, I have a few comments and then we can go on mm -hmm. with the discussion. One is, this sort of reminds me of the Tower of Babel, just uh, mm -hmm. to quote, come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. That seems like the perfect analog to a certain mm -hmm. subject, subjectivist understanding. And also, I'd, I'd go Hegelian here and even say that you don't necessarily disagree with Lacan because for Lacan, <laughs> the unconscious is not the subjective. The unconscious is is the most um, the most symbolic thing. Where you got the big other, you got all kinds of ideologies, you got uh, the day, you got sort of uh, cliches all stored in the unconscious. So unconscious is not the kernel of the self, but exactly where the self meets the world. So I'd say that you're not in a fundamental disagreement with Lacan, but you're ex making Lacan explicit rather than him speaking in his um, tongues. Uh, the last thing that I kind of want to comment is this sort of reminds me of Wittgenstein's um, argument for the non-existence of private language. And you need the external verification for any meaning to occur. And it is impossible for that to happen if I'm just by yourself thinking that you, you mean something. Because you can't, it's not only that other people can't be sure of what you mean, but you yourself can't even be sure of what you meant uh, a second ago if you don't have any external verification. And then um, I kind of want to go back then to the discussion of the subjective and the objective. So we've critiqued, I'd say, the subjective understanding. Do you have any criticisms of the objective understanding mm -hmm. and any way for the two to be fused? Because I think there are certain merits to the objective and the subjective understanding. Because I think we can sort of intuitively see that there is a way in which we do feel... Uh, in which social institutions and norms of sort of constricting and the way that the, the way the role that I am assigned in society doesn't necessarily align with my own most desires, goals and strivings. And I think that's where the subjective understanding touches a chord in people. And I don't think like one should ignore it because in order to in order to defeat something, one has to understand it. Right. And then the objective understanding. I guess it, it has it also has its um, benefits or its pros in that it gives a stable foundation from which we can talk to each other without the whole Tower of Babel situation. So how would you see the conflict between the two and recon maybe the reconciliation and the problems of the objective stance after talking about we've talked talking about the problems with a subjective one? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say with the objective stance, I would say that the main problem is that it fundamentally does not um, unify with the view or the approach of the person. Because I would say the problem of the subjective is the same way as the problem of the objective. They're the inverse of each other. Precisely, that's where the problem lies, is that, well, the objective stance, being objective, will never be able to fully encompass what one means, but rather... And this, I would say, is benefit. It provides a guideline for which one can base their idea around. For example, and I think that this is fundamentally the core problem of modern gender theory, is to say that you can be who you can create for yourself an identity independent of the world, which is unique to yourself, and you can create and attach properties to it in whatever way you want to, without any regard to the world around you. And I would say that that's a very dangerous idea because, well, it's the same problem to say, well, let's, we've killed, I think it's fundamentally the Nietzschean problem saying, well, we've killed God. Now, where on earth are we going to go on from there? Like, you now have absolutely a blank state. Well, what on earth are you going to create apart from redepending yourself or depending yourself on the past? And, it, and, it, and that makes, it leads to even more dangers because then you lead to confusion and as a form of gender nihilism. But let me go back for first to what I was saying is the dangers, right? And I would say that the problem that 
when you say okay he him or he or her and she her whatever it is right um the, the problem is is that in that circumstance what you notice very quickly is that when you're talking about um the situation right when you're talking about he him your understanding of he him might be very different from what other people even as a whole view as he him of course there are going to be similarities like uh, ability to reproduce the having male gametes the idea of um the idea of being the protector the the knight perhaps instead of being the the princess in distress of course that might be considered as quite controversial but i mean look at literature that's generally how the thing is constructed it's kind of completely factual i mean there are going to be similarities but of course there are going to be differences as well for example the muslim idea of he him is different from the christian idea of he him in christian is fully monogamous in the muslim it is um one male to multiple females and there are different conceptions of what he him um, entails and what she uh, she um it what, what what the hell she her um um could, could, like um has right so in some sense uh, there is going to be differences and i think that there has to be kind of this merging of the two and that's why we raise judeo christian um kind of ideal uh thoughts in the first place actually i think <laughs> wait, what would be the what would be the gender neutral plural pronoun it's it and uh it's i don't know or is it they, they them? Is they them? Is that gender neutral or is that completely separate? Because the problem is when they you call them something, is gender neutral, but uh, I don't think it even okay. is gender neutral. Because yeah. in order to have a pronoun, you are already a, having a concept of gender. It's not saying I don't have a gender. It's to say that I have a different gender, which is gender neutral, which is a contradictio in adjective. Oh, oh, I understand now. So they them is different from it and whatever the plural form of it is, because it is really saying that. I am outside of the whole gender spectrum. And they them is saying that I am gender neutral, but gender neutral in such a way that I am still inside the spectrum. I, I still have yes. a gender. So I think, yes. I think uh, from now on, I want to be called it. Yes. Thank you. But from, um, yes, I would agree. So its view is very interesting. Yeah. However, I would say that it got it wrong because fundamentally my argument uh, being influenced by Bird Yayev would be to say that well, without the other, when you're talking about purely from a subjective idea, you may as well, for all intents and purposes, become an it. Because you're no longer a person with relationships with others. You're only an individual. And what I mean by individual it is the idea of like just a random animal. You have no relationship with others. And of course, animals do have relationships with others. But rather, it is a knowing of a person and having a complex understanding of the person, both as a personality, and, he has, and that means he's happy, he's nice, he's mean to others. But also, not only that, but rather that the individual has connections with others and have, have a deep bond with others and have a common understanding, identification, a pity, a love for each other. And it's only when you have a full social experience as such that you're allowed to go from beyond the individual into a person. And in some sense, when you, when you remove yourself from this objective, or even if you call the objective trans-subjective realm, you, you already remove yourself from the person and you already become the individual, which for all intents and purposes, even if you do believe that you are a he him subjectively, you may as well be seen from the objective as an it. Because no one on earth knows what you're going to talk about at all. And if you're not going to comply with the common conception of the time, what happens is that there is no longer any meaning to these words and makes you an it de facto. Okay. Um, first, I realized what the plural of it is. It's well, so on Google it says it's day or damn, but I don't think it necessarily encapsulates the whole thing. I think it can be it and those, it and those. Mm -hmm. But let's get off that discussion. So, so let's recap here. We got we started from the subjective and objective dichotomy, and that's where the modern debate of gender identity sort of confuses itself and, and go, goes at an impasse, and then we critiqued both the subjective and the objective part. And after we, we, after now, after critiquing the subject and objective part, I think we can move on to the part of um, how, how can we reconcile the subjective and objective understanding? So rather than maybe rejecting one side for the other, because I think that won't necessarily go anywhere because one cannot convince another person by just rejecting the ideology. We can somehow take the good stuff 
uh, from from both sides and throw throw away the chaff and sublate it into something new. And then from this, then um, my question for you would be something like after the social training requires social training for you to become a person. Do you think one would, do you think after all those training, it might be reasonable for one to create new words and pronouns? Because I mean, that's what great artists do, right? You can't understand Ulysses or Finnegan's Wake, but you can't dispute that it's a great work, even though it's really boring. And at the same time, I think Deleuze, <laughs> Deleuze had an argument uh, about Kafka in, in one of the, in his book on Kafka, saying that Kafka is what, what what we can call a minor literature, and what it means by Kafka being someone who writes a minor literature is someone who takes these hidden strands in the linguistic realm and so takes it out and give it new vitality and create new forms of being and meaning through picking up those strands. And could you even say that? Like the maestro can somehow create, but maybe you need the apprenticeship uh, process with the objective until you can go to the subjective. So the subjective and the objective are not on the same temporal plane against each other, but rather they're on a narrative arc uh, supporting each other. I completely agree with that. And I completely agree with the idea that you first start off with the objective and move to the subjective. So I think a lot of times people criticize the right by saying, well, the subjective you're completely removing the subjective. And I agree that that's correct criticism. I think it's dangerous to completely remove the subject. But at the same time, I think that's completely dangerous to get rid of all the objective, as that just sometimes done. And I think, let's turn back, and I think that this is precisely the area where the Judeo-Christian kind of analogy is so beautiful, is that the law, which came in the Old Testament, was a necessary prerequisite for a fallen human being. So in some sense, the law was only created, this di distinction between good and evil was only created because of the fall. Before that, there was only good and evil in value. There wasn't good and evil in moral law. And it was only because people have fallen and have fallen and have completely lost their way into nothingness, which required there to be a law to say, well, this is the proper direction, the objective for which you have to carry on and develop yourself. And it's only when someone has a proper understanding of the law, and that was the Pharisees, the Pharisees fully fulfilled the law in some sense, but missing the purpose or the reason of the law. And it was only when the law was fully understood by the Pharisees, which Jesus comes along and says, well, I came to fulfill the law. He didn't say, I came to destroy the law. He said, I came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. It's to bring people beyond good and evil. And in, in, almost in a Nietzschean sense, although at the same time, it's not the, to a will to power, but more so a will to creation. And this is the entire Berdyaevian um, framework. It's to say, well, we have to go beyond the law. And in the same way, we are going beyond the objective. But the way to go beyond the objective is not to remove the object, but rather to fulfill it. It is within the mastery of the objective, which allows you to have a development of the objective. For example, how on earth are you meant to understand your own conception of he, him, without understanding first what tradition and history developed of he, him? How on earth are you meant to understand your understanding of your own gender identity without understanding what it first meant to the construction or, or what history has developed it in the past? And that is precisely what the conflict is. I think that that is how you unify, is to first develop through the objective and into the subjective in the same way that it goes beyond good and evil as a moral law into a, into an eth a new ethic, which is one of creation, whatever you want to call it. And that is kind of the analogy there. Well, there was a Sermon on the Mount now we have the Sermon on Mount Harrow. Where is, do you have any, anything else that you want to add? I think that's a perfect place to end. Indeed, I think that, that is a perfect place. And I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you enjoy it, please make sure, feel free to like this video. And I'll see you in the next one. Stay safe, my friends. Thanks for watching.